upcoming webinar series. There are webinar series that are, uh, uh, you know, helping landscapers be more eco-friendly and more successful in running their businesses. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and so tonight we have Eric Maurer. He's from Newdorf, the makers of Fiesta Weed Control. We've been using it for many years. And Eric's got a lot of information to share with us. So Eric, go ahead, you're on. Thanks, Barry, really appreciate it. Thank you everybody for being here. And really Barry, thank you so much for this invitation. It's, a, it's an honor to be here tonight. And I mean that sincerely because without Barry, I may may not be sitting in front of you today, to be honest, because Barry was my very, very first Fiesta customer in the United States. So he was the first person to buy Fiesta in the United States. Some of you may know Fiesta is the number one uh, selective broadleaf herbicide used in Canada. Most shows you the innovative nature that Barry has, um, the entrepreneurial nature that Barry has in this industry. And I'm just one of many, many, many that respect him for that. So thank you very much, Barry. Really very much appreciative. Um, so oh, today, um, you know, <laughs> <laughs> today, we're going to do a couple things, you guys. Um, I'm going to do a little pesticides 101. I'm going to talk a little bit about biopesticide, just a little bit, tell you what that market looks like and why you should use biopesticides. Some of the, some of the hurdles to overcome, some of the hurdles that are out there um, with, with, um, with biopesticides, whether from a, um, mostly just from an adoption standpoint. I wanna talk a little bit about 25B pesticides or minimum risk, that those, those terms can be used interchangeably. And then OMRI listed or organic listed products or organic listed, um, yeah, products. Um, there's a lot of misinformation out there and we just wanted to use this opportunity to kind of, you know, get everybody on the same page with what those, with what those, um, what those terms actually mean, what they convey and what they don't convey. Um, so there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of, that's a very important, um, very important. Understanding the nomenclature that we utilize every day is, is very important just to make sure we're all on the same page. Um, so, and in the end, I'm gonna give you a update on Fiesta herbicide. It, that is a, a selective broadleaf weed killer, but also uh, early post pre-emergent grass control. I'm gonna show you the, uh, some, some information, some, some background information on the liquid. And that's a little bit of a, of, of a, of a heads up that we have a, a new product that I want to share with you tonight on, in that, uh, under that brand name. So I'll give you, so about half the time I'm going to spend on that first part, Pesticides 101, and then the second part going to spend some time on Fiesta. So um, if you have any questions, please feel free to jump in uh, via the uh, chat. And um, as, as noted, please type your questions in the chat, and we'll ask them during breaks at the end. Thank you for that, Diana. Um, so I'm just going to jump right in here and um, looks like, uh, there we go. So what is a pesticide? I just have a slide here. So, you know, a pesticide really is, is a label. If the label makes a claim, then it's a pesticide. And a pesticide by definition is it kills a pest, right? That pest can be an insect. It can be a weed. It can be a, a fungus. It can be, um, uh, it can be a, a virus. It can be a bacteria. You know, Clorox bleach, um, chlorine bleach is, is, a, is a registered pesticide uh, because it controls bacteria. Um, so it, this is just, it's a very general term. And in most cases, if that label makes a claim then it must be registered by EPA in most cases. And we're gonna get into that, that, um, that exception here shortly. Um, but it's a, it's a broad term. Many folks, uh, it's kind of interesting. And I see this, I, I, even, even, even in the media, I hear pesticides and herbicides. Um, and I always kind of, I always brought a little bit of a smile to my face because a uh, pesticide is an herbicide. You know, they're, they're not separate definitions. Pesticide would be at that umbrella, that umbrella term, and then herbicide would fall under that. So I always just thought that was kind of an interesting because a weed is a pest. You know, a pest is something you don't want in the position it is, is, it, is in. And what's, what's kind of ironic about that, oh man, I don't want to go down too many uh, rabbit holes here, but, you know, grass, grass, can be a pest when it's not in 
when it's not where you want it, right? So it's also the, the you know wh where that uh, where that particular pest is located defines it as a pest, and that's subjective. I get it. I understand that completely. Um, moving right along, biopesticides are a uh, a subset of pesticides um, that are derived from natural materials. Um, Fiesta is one is a biopesticide because its active ingredient is iron, and iron is a natural material. Now there are a lot, a lot of other products that fall under this under this definition, and some of this data is a bit bit dated, um, but you know it, it at least gets the message across that there are a lot of biopesticides out there. There's 299 registered biopesticide active ingredients that make for over 1400 biopesticide products, right? Because you can have the same active ingredient in, in, in more than one product. So that's why there's you know, more, more products than there are active ingredients. Um, <clears throat> from a registration standpoint, and this is kind of important, I could go back, I should have introduced myself a little bit better, but I did right out of college, I spent uh, 10 years at EPA. And so I have, I have a good regulatory background and it's, it's really important in this job because, you know, regulatory compliance is, is of utmost importance. I mean, it is, it is a black and white uh, line for me. You either are in compliance or you're not. And, you know, we've always said that, you know, the cost of, of non-compliance is a lot greater than the cost of compliance. So, you know, we don't mess around when it comes to come when it comes to that, you know, when you're looking at state registrations or, um, or, you know, um, following the label, the label is the law, they have things along those lines. These are really important um, components of, of the regulatory structure that I, that I take very, I personally take very seriously. But from a regulatory standpoint, so there's a couple of ways to get a, a, a pesticide registered at EPA. You can go the traditional route via the registration division, or you can go the biopesticide route with the EPA's biopesticide division. Now, a biopesticide, for it to be deemed as such, has to um, meet some, certain criteria according to the EPA. Naturally occurring, have a non-toxic mode of action, and have a history demonstrating minimal toxicity and exposure to humans in the environment. Now, this is, this is all defined by studies that are required by EPA to meet these specific requirements, okay? Eric, um, Eric, this is not something... Yeah. I have a question here. So how do they define non-toxic mode of action? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it, it's a very good question. But the, my understanding here, and without, without getting too, too deep into it, Barry, is that based on the studies that are submitted, that would be whether it falls under a certain acute level of toxicity, OK? So if, if for example, with Viesta, the the uh, the LD50 or the lethal dose that will harm 50% of a population ha is over a certain amount, then it can be it will be uh, determined to have a non-toxic mode of action. That's my understanding. I'd have to dig into that a little bit deeper to get you probably a better answer on that, Barry. No, thanks, Eric. I'd like to do that. That's a great question. Um, the um, so the opportunities here and and the benefits of getting a biopesticide in many cases are um, are are the fact that you can call it a biopesticide. I mean, it has a it has a softer connotation. Um, it connotes softer chemistry in many cases. That that's not always the case. Um, but in the end, um, what it does is it provides for a faster. A uh, path to registration in terms of number of months required to 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 um, for EPA to complete the the registration process, and it also costs less. Okay, so in many cases there is a there is a strong um, uh, incentive from the manufacturers to to um, <clears throat> to um, to manufacture softer chemistry to manufacture biopesticides in terms of in terms of access to the market. Um, but also in terms of, you know, actually providing softer chemistry because that demand is out there and we're going to get to that a little bit. <clears throat> so here's some ideas why, why people might not use biopesticides. And many of these are just have just have kind of developed a life of their own over time. They don't work. They're too expensive. There certainly is a lack of awareness and there's a lack of information and education on that. Um, you know, the first two clearly are, are not are not the case anymore. I'm going to get into that a little bit. And the second two really 
it's why I'm here today. <laughs> um, because a lot of it is just generating awareness. People don't know what they don't know. And the more, more opportunities we have to get the message out there, the better off we're all going to be. So they do work, right? Manufacturers are constantly developing increasingly efficacious products based on demand from end users. You know, if I, I mean, at least once a month, and I'm not kidding, I get a request for an organic um, plant growth regulator. <laughs> you know, so, and so these are, what's great about that is like, first of all, that gives us an idea of what the demand is like out there and that there is a demand for it. And you know, it's it's a whole it's a it's it's a hole in the marketplace from from the standpoint of what people are really looking for. Um, so there's that. Uh, research from third parties and universities and independent research are commonplace now. You know, with these products, we need to give because these because there's that uh, there's the um, uh, idea or uh, uh, idea that 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 these products don't work based mostly on the past and because back in the day there were there were products that didn't work um, that uh, but again that that's changing um, but so as a result of, of developing these products the you know research is oh, man it's just so important to give end users something to hang their hat on and distribution something to hang their hat on so they can so they feel comfortable and have have a comfort level in in, in its efficacy. Because to be honest with you guys, you know, EPA does not require efficacy data for registration. It doesn't. California does and Canada does. EPA does not require efficacy data for registration. But in the end, manufacturers aren't going to spend the money on the registration process, which is which is very expensive, very expensive. And a lot of these, you know, developing this research is very expensive. You know, we're not going to go down that road and sell a product that doesn't work in the end. So, um, Cost is increasingly less of a factor. You know, you know, higher volume based on increased demand lowers the cost of production. And again, I noted earlier, regulatory costs are typically less than your conventional route of registration via the registration division, standard route to the to, to the market. And many and in many cases, I can only speak for us. Those those uh, those reduced costs are passed on to the end user, or at least taken into account when we are establishing uh, end user pricing or distributor pricing, I should say. And we all know awareness and demand is increasing. Holy cow! I still say, and I've been saying this for twelve years. I've been working for Nudor for six years, and prior to that, worked for a company called Engage Agro, which launched Fiesta in the U.S. Um, you know, for 12 years, I've been saying we're still ahead of the curve on this demand, and I still think we're there. Uh, I still think we're ahead of the curve. A lot of this is based on the um, the legislative restrictions, municipal restrictions that are increasing. I live in Maryland. I'm a stone store from Montgomery County, so I'm very familiar with what's going on there. Fiesta is allowed for use there. Um, that's a whole nother, whole nother path we could spend a whole bunch of time on, a very interesting one. But anyway... The awareness and demand is increasing across the board. And I know I'm preaching to the choir here. A lot of that came from a lot of that came from the the uh, the glyphosate um, uh, class action lawsuit that occurred several years ago. I mean, it it really raised awareness because of the of, of the money that was the, the, the dollar amounts that were being thrown around and that were being um, handed down by the courts. So a lot of people jumped on that. On, on that bandwagon. But what it did is it, it kind of made people think, and I've talked to people about this, and I'm just conveying what, what relaying what I've heard is that, you know, it raised the awareness uh, across the board about, hey, well, wait a minute, don't we use Roundup or don't we use glyphosate? And then what else do we use? Let's, let's consider this. And then of course, COVID, when, uh, you know, when all things broke loose and people were home and spending more time home, that, that exacerbated and uh, added fuel to the fire from the standpoint of, People doing their own doing their own work or just looking into it deeper what they're actually putting on their properties. Oh, <clears throat> managing expectations is critical for these products because they don't work like our traditional chemistries, and nor do we want them to in the end. But um, you know, we have to let folks know what to expect and what not to expect, how to use them correctly. You know, these are not order taker products, these are order maker products. I mean. We talked about, um, we're gonna talk about it here in a second, about education and, um, and, and awareness. And education is so important and, and managing those expectations in an effort to 
to um, so so the customer's happy. So the customer's happy in the end, and they and they'll and they'll they'll continue to use pro these types of products. Um, Another reason to use uh, use biopesticides again, by definition, they're inherently less toxic than con their conventional partners, their conventional um, alternatives. Um, they generally only affect the target pest, and they often decompose quickly, resulting in lower exposure. I can use Fiesta as an example because I know that product's really, really well. As soon as it's dry, it's done working, right? So you're looking at you know, as opposed to. Um, you know, a, a, a systemic product that hangs out in the uh, in the environment for much longer. You know, there's a comfort level that is. You know, as soon as it's uh, I apply it, it's dry. Kids can go out, dogs can go out. It's all good. Um, and that's a yeah. And and that's really that's not really even based on toxicity. That's because Fiesta is blood red, and we don't want to stain the pet's fur or the kid's shoes. Anyway, that's a little uh, side sidebar there. And biopesticide demand is real. This is old data. These, these, these are old data. You can see it's 19% of total pesticide sales and almost half of insecticide sales. Um, <clears throat> you know, insecticides, my understanding is uh, herbicides make up the most, uh, the, the largest percentage of pesticides sold than insecticides and fungicides. That's my understanding. Uh, I could be wrong on that. But um, so if you're looking at the, these percentages, you're looking at a, a, a serious volume of products, of biopesticide products that are being sold in, in, into the market, in the U.S. market. And yeah, the US I, I, can see, and I can see the date on that. That was uh, 20, or, I mean, 12 years 2011. ago. 2011. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Can you imagine what it's like now? Yeah, exactly. And I could not find it. That's, you know, you got to pay a big money for these types of data if it's current. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, but, you know, just... You know, just from in the three years, four, 11, 12, 44 years between 11 and 14, you know, you're looking at a 200% increase globally, $1.9 billion. Um, and, you know, you're still seeing major companies investing a lot of money and a lot of resources into the biopesticide market. Um, <clears throat> so I think we can all we can all agree that the, the biopesticides are, are here to stay. Any questions on biopesticides? Okay, I'm rolling right along. So I we're going to talk about. I have a question for you, Eric. <laughs> I okay. was trying to unmute. Yeah. Sorry, I wasn't quick enough on the draw. Um, you mentioned that efficacy data is not required by the EPA. Do you mean for biopesticides only, or no? I mean for all for all products. Really. Interesting. Really. Okay. I mean, it's submitted. It is submitted, and they'll keep it on file. Because we do do, um, industry does, restaurants do, obviously, like I was saying, run F because they want to make sure it works. They don't want to sell anything that doesn't work because it's not going to be around for very long because um, the proof's in the pudding in the end. Um, and it is submitted and they'll hold it on file. But California requires efficacy data and PMRA Canada requires efficacy data. Okay, but the EPA does or not registration. require it. Correct. Okay. All right, cool, thanks. So minimum risk pesticides are 25B. Now 25B, the reason we call them 25B is because that's a section of FIFRA. And FIFRA rules pesticide regulatory um, uh, EPA. Uh, FIFRA and the, uh, and, and um, oh gosh, I'm, I'm, I'm drawing a blank right now. Uh, FIFRA, uh, 20, that's all right. I'm going to go, I'm going to pass along that. But FIFRA really is the uh, the law that uh, the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act, that's an acronym for that, um, rules EPA and, and, and the business they do to, to register pesticides. And under that section 25B, it, um, it exempts certain products from federal regulation um, under, that, under that act. Um, 25B, 25B exempt. Now, that's not to say many states, not all states, but many states, at least 40 that I could count at last, still require registration of these products, even though EPA does not require registration. So the pesticide requirements, so <clears throat> there are oh, there are 44 active ingredients on that list. Okay. Eric, I'm sorry. And that I, I, want, is, I want to back up a little bit because um, you know, each state has different regulations, and um, yeah, in some states, 25B, you don't need a pesticide license to apply them for hire. In other states, you do. So it's important to know what your state laws are. Absolutely, yes. Thank, thank you for sharing that, Barry. Yeah, 
Yeah, as, I, as that last bullet says, there are there are various requirements, and you know it's not just from a regulatory standpoint; it's from a practical standpoint. Yes, from an actual licensing standpoint at the applicator level. So that's very important to know. Thank you for adding that. So there's 44 active ingredients on this list. It's an old list. Um, it's not. It's very unlikely, in my 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 opinion, that they're, they're, that list is going to be changed because if they're going to do that, they have to open up the entire law entire FIFRA to make that change. That's my understanding. I could be wrong on that. Um, also, there's an inert ingredient list, and there are dozens and dozens. I mean, there's over 100 uh, uh, on that list. So it has to include certain products to meet these criteria. There's also labeling requirements that are, um, that, um, that must, there's also labeling requirements for each of these products as well. Now, those are, you know, there are still, <laughs> The EPA still rules the federal label, even though re registration isn't required, there are still labeling requirements per the EPA and the states will follow those requirements. For example, the active ingredient has to be listed, the inerts have to be listed, um, et cetera. So there are still some basic um, labeling requirements for all 25B products. And, and yeah, I'll, some of the, I'll, I'll, I'll point out that the um, you know regular pesticides don't have to list their uh, inert ingredients. Is that correct? That is correct. It can be under other. That's true. That is correct. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, um, the so I don't know. Let me back up. So I don't know exactly. I, I could be. I'd have to dig down in this a little bit, Barry, because I'm not sure the EPA. Now the the innards have to fall under a list. Yeah. No. I think they they you know they I'm, you're right. They I'm going back to my original point. The innards do have to be identified on the 25B list because they have to be identified in that list. They have to show that they are they are part on that list as well. So everything we were talking about earlier is you, you are right and and uh, my original point was right. Um, so the label, so you can't make specific claims to organisms that mitigate organisms that pose a threat to human health. So you can, you, for example, you can say, you can say on a 25B product that it controls mosquitoes, but you can't say it controls mosquitoes that cause West Nile virus. So you can see the, the, the nuance there. Company name and address must appear on the label and the label may not contain any false or misleading statements. And those are all identified in, in the label review manual. Um, state specific requirements, as I said, there's about 40 states that still require registration of, of um, 25B or minimum risk products. Um, and each, as Barry noted as well, each state may have different label requirements, which makes it difficult for companies to comply with all states. What I'm saying there is that you almost have, because of, it almost kind of falls under almost like a fertilizer label because fertilizer fertilizers aren't regulated by EPA at the federal level, at least. Um, a lot of the states have different labeling requirements and very similar for these for these minimum risk 25B products. So it makes it, you know, it's it makes it difficult from the stamp from a compliance standpoint. Getting from a getting back to the my compliance messages earlier makes it difficult from a compliance standpoint to make sure that some of these labels stay stay within the states in which they're registered in or which the label has been approved in. Um, so, you know, you almost have to have a, a label that is that complies with the most restrictive state um, and utilize that label for all states, which can be, which can, you know, put you at a disadvantage in the marketplace, depending on what else is out there. So jumped ahead a little bit, but you know we talked a little bit about you know the the fertilizer. This is the American Association of the American Association of Pest Control Officials. They created a 25B work group. Geez, about man, probably now six six seven years ago at least. All of that that provides label guidance to help companies comply with state requirements because of the various requirements. It's all in the interest of making sure we're all doing the right thing. Any questions on minimum risk 25B? Okay, I'm gonna move a little bit along here on OMRI listed products. This, this is a, for those of us that can remember, this is kind of like the underwriters laboratories, the UL listed um, um, uh, um, UL listed, uh, geez, I can't think of the word I'm looking for, the um, 
you know, back in the day, UL listed used to be on electrical appliances. And it, you know, there was a safe, there was a, a safety, uh, an understanding that the product was safe for, for, for use in the home, kind of that. I'm gonna go out on a limb there. Um, probably wrong in that, but yeah, I think you get the idea. So an Omri listed really, it's a long way of saying it's like a box checking. It's a box checking. It checks the box that this has gone through a review um, that products or um, uh, listed products have gone under a review that meets certain criteria that have been uh, generally approved or generally agreed upon that are safer to use in, in certain agricultural products. So Omri is the Organic Materials Review Institute. Um, it is a third party certifier of agricultural inputs. Okay, there that is not the only one. There are others out there. Washington State has one, California has one. Um, and this, these are certifiers of the um, um, USDA's National Organic Program. And again, it's important to note that these are this is a certifier of agricultural inputs. Hold that to hold that thought there for a second. Um, the National Organic Program is a federal regulatory program that develops and enforces consistent standards, again, for agricultural products sold in the U.S. It does not include certification for inputs for non-agricultural commodities. So what I'm just saying there right there is that there is no standard OMRI listed, and there's no OMRI standard for non-agricultural products or for lawn care products. Okay, um, nursery and greenhouse does fall under agricultural production. It's my understanding um, from a regulatory perspective, from a regulatory standpoint, that's it's grouped in that in that same category. But certainly for non-agricultural um, markets, uh, lawn care, golf, um, yeah, those would, would would not fall in into this category. Um, so OMRI listed. So OMRI listed means these are agricultural products, agricultural products, and the underlines are the underlying words here are, are important. Agricultural products that can be USDA certified organic. Okay, this is when you go in your grocery store and you see that 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 uh, that um, organic listed or um, uh, or uh, um, okay for use for organic production. I forget exactly what what those terms are. Those those. Uh, uh, identifiers are on the packaging, but you know it, it is it is a it's a very strong marketing um, uh, component utilized by by food manufacturers in the in, in the grocery stores. We've all seen it. Um, most input products such as fertilizers, pesticides, etc., are ineligible for organic certification. So there's a difference between what I'm saying here is that there's a difference between organic certification and organic listing. Okay, inputs are listed the end product can be certified, okay? That's the difference. And that's an important um, uh, difference to, 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 be, to, to be certain of. Um, and, that, and that's what I'm getting at at that last point, getting ahead of myself here. So inputs um, are suitable for organic food and fiber production, right? So again, uh, the, the, the inputs are organic listed, the end, end use products are organic certified. Um, inputs must be listed prior to use on a certified organic operation. Most of my understanding is uh, on the agricultural side, there are um, each state, um, I believe it's each state, might be each county has organic certifiers that will work with the farmers to make sure and look at their program. And it's not just inputs, it's not just inputs, it's, it's their farm operation. It's what they use on the farm, on the, uh, you know, whether they have cattle on, on that farm, whether, you know, what equipment they're using, is it cleaned? I mean, this is not just, um, you know, we're just really talking about inputs into, uh, into um, uh, you know, pesticide inputs. Um, and OMRI will review input products to verify that they meet the organic standards for use in organic farms or in organic processing. So this kind of, again, conveys that, that very powerful message that, that OMRI listed is, is a third party certifier of the National Organic Program standards utilized for agricultural inputs only. And that there really is no true organic OMRI listing for non-agricultural inputs. No, nor, no standard for non-agricultural inputs. Any questions on that or comments, Barry? Yeah, I have a comment. Um, the reason why this is so important, we had a case that came up last year where a, a manufacturer's um, 
and we test the product as a non-selective herbicide, it worked amazingly well. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> the state of California did some uh, research on it and, and analyzed it, and they found that there it, it was not organic. It did contain <laughs> glyphosate and several other things. So um, that company is defunct now. Yeah. Yeah. It works great, it's very, but very now I know why. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, if, if if I recall, you know, we were talking earlier before we all got on, you can't have your cake and eat it too. Yeah. And I think this, the, this, that particular product tried to get away with doing both. And, you know, yeah. when, when you, when I see organic and systemic in the same sentence, it all automatically raises a red flag to me. Yeah. Anyway. That's that's a whole other story. That's that, that's another 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 session that you can have <laughs> host Perry. Uh, okay, so um, yeah, so here's the summary, and that I've kind of gone through this already. Um, there's a lot of value to OMRI listed inputs and OMRI listed products. Don't get me wrong. Um, I just think it's important to note that um, these these really were. These really have evolved. The, you know, this this OMRI listing has evolved into something it probably wasn't originally intended to do. Shocker. <laughs> um, but you know that that's what happens. You know, the, uh, the un, uncertain or unknown consequences as a result of of, of legislation. There's always going to be that, and I, and it is a good thing. It does give folks um, a comfort level. It checks a box for a lot of um, of um, of. Uh, um, uh, checks the box for a lot of end users, um, but you know there there is a there is a disconnect on 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 this a, a lot of it because there are you know I, I I'm aware of you know it's it's not just about it's just a bigger picture it's it's just not that simple you know it's it doesn't it's not that simple um, if you really want to get into the details of this you know there are OMRI listed products that are more toxic than non OMRI listed products. Um, and then it is just the way it is. Um, so if you're looking at just toxicity, then you don't necessarily want to look at OMRI listings. But if you know it, it, it can be, it, it's, it's just a bigger picture. It's more involved than that. And I understand the value. Don't get me wrong. And I think it's an important component, but just has to be understood a little bit better. Um, and that's that's. I'll get off my soapbox now. Okay. So um, does anybody have any questions on OMRI listing or kind of a pesticides 101? I know there's a lot of information here. I know it's being recorded, so you'll have some time to look through these slides. Um, if you'd like to chat about this more, I'd be more than happy to after the fact or a week down the road after you're listening to it uh, while you're weeding. Um, but um, anyway, if um, you can always give me a call, we can chat. I'll chat about it a little bit more because I don't know what I don't know either. There's, there's certainly some things on here that... Um, you know, this is a, these are a very general overview. Um, and like I said um, earlier, but the devil is in the details with, with a lot of this. So um, the further you get into it, the, the more challenging it can be. So I, I understand that and respect that. So many of you understand what's going on or have heard of Fiesta Turf Weed Killer. We, uh, Neudorf does manufacture this product. This is just gonna give you a quick idea. Many of you have seen this video. It's a 30 second time-lapse video shows you what to expect when you use Fiesta. This is a liquid Fiesta. It's an iron-based product, kills weeds fast. As you can see, kills broadleaf weeds fast, doesn't affect the uh, turf, doesn't cause phytotoxicity to the turf. Um, and it turns the weed black. Those are the three things I'd like you to take away from this. Works fast, doesn't cause turf burn, and it turns the weed black. So it kind of blends in with the turf grass. That's all, that. This is on online. If you ever want to take a look at it uh, further, or just give me a call and I'll send you the link. Um, this is a, this is Ohio State University data getting into the research behind the product. Uh, you have to see the application on the right. I believe that's two applications on the right and nothing on the left. A check on the left, mostly clover. You're seeing one of the side effects also of the, uh, which is a, a positive uh, in most cases. Uh, depending on how you're using it uh, and where you're using it, but you're seeing green up in that uh, area that is a, that Fiesta was applied to. I think that's exacerbated a little bit by the lack of clover in there, but still, yeah, you definitely do see some green up as a result of that pesticide Fiesta application. Uh, this is my lawn, some oxalis. Again, works fast. I, you, it does look a little bit like turf burn there, but that's that's the photographer's fault. That would be me. 
And um, so, yeah, you can blame me on that one, but it does work. It works fast and um, it really, really does a, a bang up job on it. This was uh, right next to my driveway. Um, this is new data. This is Black Medic. This came from uh, University of Guelph Turfgrass Research Institute. This is one application for Black Medic control. Really did a bang up job on it. And you know, the yes, is that way. It's it's um it's 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 so fun to use. It really is because it works so fast. Um, it's a completely non toxic mode of action. Um, and it's you know cost and signal word. Really, what it does is really what it does is it overdoses the, I'm probably getting ahead of myself here, but it's mode of action is it, it's, it's iron toxicity, right? It gives it too much of a good thing. We all know iron is a plant nutrient. It's a human nutrient, it's ubiquitous in the earth's crust. Um, it's, it's necessary, it's just a, a necessary um, uh, um, uh, compound. Um, yeah, necessary compound for, for, for life on the planet. But in the end, so plants use iron and they use it very efficiently and very effectively. Um, but when you give it too much, it causes cell necrosis and disables the plant cells ability to breathe. So that's why it works so fast. Now, Fiesta is a patented formulation. It's pat so not all irons are created equal. It's patented for absorption and selectivity, right? So you're, that's why you're not seeing the turf burn and that's why you're seeing such a fast mode of action. This is 2018 data out of Rutgers. What I just want to show you right now is Fiesta for the longest time has been has been sold and marketed as a post-emergent broadleaf weed killer. But we also have data to show that it works on uh, works pre-emergent, and I would rather actually say early post on smooth crabgrass. So all I want you to do is focus here. This is liquid. This is the liquid again. So we're uh, focus on the black arrows. You're seeing three applications of Fiesta and three applications of corn gluten, and you're seeing better efficacy with uh, with comparable number of applications. Then if you go over to the red arrow, you're seeing just a single application of Fiesta compared to the corn gluten, you're still seeing better efficacy. So in the end, it works better than corn gluten. That's just really what all I want to take want you to take away from this. This was the first year we had uh, we did uh, uh, research at Rutgers. You know, we saw it working early post uh, in the lab and said, you know, we should probably give this a try in the field. So we kind of did a shotgun approach on timing and things like that. We probably could have done a better job on timing. Timing is always going to be important, especially when it comes to crabgrass. I'm going to get into that a little bit later because we have some more recent data. Um, we, one question I get a lot of, I just want to address it here, especially since this is being recorded, is the use of additives or surfactants uh, mixing with Fiesta. Long story short, yes, go ahead and add a, add a surfactant to Fiesta. It's gonna improve your, um, improve efficacy about 10% on harder to control weeds, okay? But just be careful, you can, you can reduce the use of, you can reduce the selectivity component of Fiesta. Um, the only thing I suggest is just, you know, use, use the surfactant judiciously and use it according to the label. You only need a little bit because um, you don't wanna burn the turf, right? It's just the nature of the beast. Yeah, we, we recommend that. we recommend using yucca at a very low rate to to work as a surfactant. Okay, can Perfect. you elaborate? Can you elaborate on that yucca pro? What what specifically yucca are you like? What product are you talking about, or what kind of product? Well, we, we have a product that's called Thermex, um, and it, it's it's extract from the yucca plant. Um, Eric might be better able to explain how it works than I can. Yeah, Hopefully. no, that's okay. <laughs> yeah, really, what you're going to get, you, what you're going to get is is uh, better adherence on the plant, on the on the broadleaf plant, um, uh, on 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 the on the weed, just by the nature of the way broadleaf weeds grow versus turf grass. Right, you're going to get better absorption. It's going to hang out on that on on the on the larger surface. Of a broadleaf weed as opposed to turf grass. Also, just the nature of, of, of the of the the way they grow, you know, laying flat versus turf grass being a vertical, vertically grown plant, gen generally speaking. Um, and that's why you're seeing we see some efficacy on the crabgrass too, because of the way it grows. It grows more flat, right? And you have a larger surface area. But when you use a surfactant, you know, you you run the risk, you do run the risk, and again, you use use a surfactant ju judiciously. 
In this case, we're looking at, we did not, this is not yucca. This is a high quality non-ionic and a high quality silicone surfactant. So you're getting in both cases increased efficacy with, with, with each one of these. But in the end, you could cause the, if you use too much of the surfactant, you could get it to uh, adhere more effectively to the turf grass than, than you'd like. <laughs> That's what it comes down to. Which could cause the grass to turn black or too dark, right? You might get too, too much absorption in the iron in the grass. Did that think, help? Yes, but is there anything DIY that someone might find under a sink or in a house in general that might be used as a surfactant? Uh, in yeah, and, and, that, and here, there, therein lies the reason we don't make any recommendations. Absolutely, because there are so many DYI options. Um, there are so many surfactants private labeled, and uh, there's just too many out there for us to make any recommendations. So, you know, whatever works for these uh, for these end users, to, whether it's you know at whatever end users are doing it, whether they're doing it out of a hand can or out of a trigger sprayer or whatever, um, you know, whatever they're doing, they can continue to do that with Fiesta. But again, just use it judiciously. So the summary with Fiesta and the liquid is, and it's labeled for the, all, all of these. Well, actually not turf green up per, per se, but that's just a secondary benefit. You get post-emergent broadleaf weed control, pre-emergent control of smooth crabgrass, turf green up, disease, moss, and algae control, right? Those are all on the label. And it's ideal for those customers that desire non-traditional chemistry for their lawns. Now, there's a lot to be said for Fiesta turf weed killer, and there's, there's things it's not. Okay, it is not unrelisted. Okay, um, it is. It is, in my humble opinion, the only product out there when, as an or as a, as an herbicide in softer chemistry lawn care programs, trans transitional chemistry lawn care programs. Um, there are a lot of folks out there that call it organic. I can't control what they say, but yeah, we've never we've never conveyed this as an organic product and never will. That would be against the law to do that. And we're not gonna do that. There's a lot of organic programs that use traditional chemistry in their organic lawn care programs, right? Because, because they just don't, they don't wanna use Fiesta or for, for whatever reason, I don't wanna, I don't wanna, I don't wanna, I don't, I don't know why they don't use Fiesta. That's I don't know. That'd be crazy to guess. But I do know that there are organic programs being marketed that don't that use traditional chemistry. Um, I would suggest, and I suggest this to, to, to end user customers that I talk to 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 you know be upfront, obviously, with what Fiesta is and what it isn't. Um, Fiesta works fast, which is great. Fiesta will work faster than traditional chemistry. It's one major benefit of it. Um, there is the chance of regrowth. Because Fiesta is a top-down killer, there is a chance for regrowth. So a second uh, application may be necessary, very likely will be necessary. It all depends on what you're trying to control, the maturity of the weed and, and, and the nature and what specific weed you're trying to control. Excuse me. The Fiesta is blood red. You have to be careful about staining and overspraying. You have to be careful when you're spraying next to fences, wood fences or porous concrete where there's the potential for staining, okay? So there's things that, you know, there's no perfect products. Fiesta isn't it, but it is, as I said, probably the only alternative out there, um, the only product out there that works in um, an alternative lawn control program. Great transitional programs too. Okay, so now that you've all stuck around, uh, give you a little uh, heads up that we now have registered by EPA a Fiesta granular weed and feed. It's registered as a weed and feed 801. State registrations are rolling in as we speak. Um, we have several already in place. Um, the, uh, the, the priority states, as you can imagine, are the Northeast, Mid-Atlantic, Upper Midwest. That's really, those are the primary states. There's probably a dozen, dozen primary uh, registration states that have already been submitted. Half of those are already registered. Um, very, very, very excited about this product. Um, we have, we're looking at a May 2023 launch this month. If everything goes as planned, we want to get it out into people's hands to touch it, feel it. Um, I'd already got um, some allotted for some of Barry's customers. Um, <clears throat> that will be the first to go out for sure. We're going to do 20 and 40 pound bags. Um, 
it is, you know, for all intents and purposes, really it's Fiesta liquid in a granular form. Okay. You're going to get all the same benefits, but it's actually going to be registered as a weed and feed. Whereas Fiesta liquid is just registered as an herbicide, you know, in hindsight, as we talk now, Fiesta liquid could have been registered as a weed and feed. It could have been. Um, but, you know, when, oh man, I guess, you know, they were, they were doing everything they could just to make it fast enough uh, for, for our Canadian customers uh, because of those provincial restrictions we talked about. Um, and so they didn't take the time, didn't have the time, is a better way of putting it. My understanding is because it's before my time, my time. Um, that uh, there wasn't necessary, just didn't have didn't have the the, the wherewithal uh, or the, the the forward thinking to do that because it was just uh, they were just going crazy uh, to get it out there. But anyway, now we're doing it right. We're doing it with the granular weed and feed, and this is going to really fill a void out there for those folks that don't want to drag hose or or um, uh, use a backpack or a hand can for the liquid. And I can understand that totally, especially if you're doing large lawns, sports fields parks, municipalities, um, anything along those lines. I will say that getting back to this really quick, um, Fiesta is a great option in these areas in sports fields and parks because of the flexibility and the use pattern, you know, because you can reseed the next day, you can uh, apply Fiesta a week after the turf grass emerges. So it gives you a lot of flexibility in fall, um, in fall overseeding programs. You know, it, it's not gonna affect those. Um, it's not going to, it gives you op options in, in, um, in high traffic areas, whether it's, you know, in between, in between the hash marks or in front of goals, you know, if you want to try, you know, uh, if you can get in there these days, I know these parks and sports fields are used 24 seven, almost if they have lights, but I know we have one by our house that it's always going, but anyway, if there's a lot of flexibility in, in those, in those, uh, in those areas, in those markets. So we have a 14% sodium ferric EDTA, that's the active ingredient, 8% um, water soluble N. Um, the, uh, so that's going to be the, uh, so that's the eight, eight zero one. So six and one fertilizes your turf while controlling weeds, moss, disease, algae, and lichens. Um, derived from lysine, that's the N, <coughs> uh, and sodium ferric EDTA, there's some N in the iron, and the potassium chloride is where the one comes from, where the K comes from. The SGN is 80. That is the, that is the prill size. Okay. Uh, gosh, uh, SGN is a size, size guide number, I think, something like that. Um, it's a prill size. It's a small, it's a small prill. You saw a photo of it. And that's that's pretty much it. Um, see, the balance of that size is, you know, it had to be it had to be heavy enough to fall out of a spreader, but it had to be light enough to stick to the plant, right? To stick to the weed. It's got, it does have an organic water soluble prill. So as soon as this touches water, it's going to dissolve, it's going to solubilize, and then it becomes essentially the liquid. Same, again, you see it's a lot of overlap here with the benefits, greens up turf in seven days or less, works fast, see results in hours. And a 20 pound bag will treat up to 6,000 square feet. And that is based on an application rate of three to eight pounds per thousand. And that's of course, depending on weed pressure. We will see, I'm gonna show you a little, a snapshot of some data that's really, really exciting. So we're looking at, again, we're looking at a six in one application. This is this is a really desirable a desirable product in this category, because um, we really feel it, it uh, you know, we're missing out a lot with, with, uh, with, with just having the liquid available. Just like with the, with the, um, with the liquid, it is a top-down kill. You re repeat the treatment three or four weeks for best results. It's not uncommon for, for these types of products, either for weed and feed products. Um, the, the, the primary primary requirement for application here is ensured turf is wet from dew or water turf lightly before application, right? Because the, 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 that little prill has got to stick to the plant for it to work, right? For it to solubilize and to work. Um, 50 to 85 degrees as far as uh, temperature restrictions. And we're just, you know, a typical broadcast rotary drop or handheld spreader. Um, you know, rate is going to be important. And this is going to be challenging. Um, we understand. We again, we don't know. We don't know. We've done our homework on spreaders. There is going to be a spreader table on the label, but you know, there's a lot of spreaders out there. Um, so, um, you know, we're going to have to be judicious in getting some feedback and and hearing, um, you know, how 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 this goes out in certain spreaders. And then we can develop. We can develop um, cell sheets and to, to help the end user down the road 
to make this an easier, an easier product to utilize as we learn more about it. So real quick, I'm going to just touch on this. There's a lot of stuff here. Um, and I can't necessarily see that bottom row, but I think we're looking, we're just comparing Fiesta granular at the three pound, five pound and eight pound rate. And then you have weed shield in the dark blue. And then you have Scott's weed and feed in the light blue. Just a couple of things I wanted to take away from this. Real important. First of all, see how fast it works. Okay. You see the first three bars, the orange, gray, and yellow bar. Those are the varying, varying rates of, of, um, of the Fiesta granular. And this is white clover. And then you see uh, Scott's weed and feed, right? Very traditional standard chemistry. You see how it works faster. At least the, the Fiesta products works faster than it decreases over up to June 30th. And then in July 11th, right? Because there's a second application made in July 7th. You see the efficacy spike up again, and it's pretty much maintained a little bit more effectively after that second application. That's important to note. You see the um, the Scott's Weed and Feed starts off with a with a less efficacious um, count initially on June seventeenth, two days after the application, and it increases over time. Okay, and then you see the uh, that is probably one that's a single application. I think I'm pretty sure I have to go back and look at the data. I should know this off the top of my head. Um, and I can't think of it, it's not coming to me, but that's very likely one. Uh, no, I think that is two applications, but anyway, either way, you're seeing the value of the Fiesta um, over the Scott's Weed and Feed. And then of course, uh, the Weed Shield not, not doing quite as good in this particular trial. So that's just something I wanna to convey to you uh, for white clover, okay? It's exciting. So, you know, again, this goes back to the data. We have data that 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 gives us a comfort level in moving forward, right? Um, there's going to be idiosyncrasies associated with each application, with each new product, with each new product launch that we don't know. Um, but what we're looking for is getting, um, you know, a soft launch this year, hopefully in May. Hopefully in May, we're hopefully, hopefully going to have product available uh, for you guys to try. So we're really looking forward to that. So here's the pre-emerge data. Um, and this is, this goes to, oh, Real quick, it's also the, the rate response, okay? You see a rate response, which is really what you, you do want to see. More is better and when it comes to an herbicide, right? Now, in this particular case, the Rutgers, I don't know if you've been to a Rutgers field day, but man, they, they, are, they, they, they make sure that they are, their, their trial plots are weed heavy. So these are not, these are not probably, these are not, uh, these are probably weedier versions of what you would normally see um, in the real world. The pre-emerge data is equally as exciting. There's a lot of stuff going on here with timing of application because that's, that is very important, especially when it comes to pre-emerge products. But again, we have the Fiesta granular and the five pound and the gray, we have the eight pound. And then you have just that Fiesta granular in the yellow as well, but a different timing. And here, interestingly, um, no, I should say not so interesting. You're seeing better efficacy with an earlier application, which is what you, sh which is what you would expect, okay? Then you have glutinate OLP, which is a liquid corn gluten, not doing as well in this particular trial. But what you do see, again, is a rate response, which you want to see, and you're seeing better efficacy early on. So as a result of these data, it helps us write the label, right? So per the label, which I, I, I don't, I'm not sharing with you here today, not for any particular reason, but just because it's just a label. Um, um, you know, we have the first application going out when uh, soil temps are at about five, uh, 55 degrees with the second application three to four weeks later. Um, so the, the, the takeaways we can get away from this is that it works a lot better than corn gluten. So you can essentially get away with not doing corn gluten applications anymore. And you're going to get, a, so with, with that single application, you're going to get that post-emergent broadleaf weeds. You're going to get early post um, a smooth crabgrass. You're going to get um, moss and algae, disease control, and green up. You're still going to get that six in one, um, six in one benefit with that single application. Um, we're looking at efficacy up to about the four leaf stage of smooth crabgrass. After that, um, not getting as good efficacy. Timing is important, and there is a rate response. I've been alluding to that uh, here uh, throughout. Two applications are better than one. Intervals three to four weeks, and geez, the crabgrass control is just another great clean, another great claim. You know, the six and one again. Here are the six, um, six really benefits: post-emergent, pre-emergent, turf green up, disease, moss, and algae control. Disease we kind of separate, and then moss and algae is kind of one. Um, there's not a whole lot of algae in turf grass, but 
But there definitely is moss. I know I have it in my lawn. <laughs> I do have some, but it's okay. I don't mind it. I'm pretty. Anyway, um, and it's in areas that grass is probably not going to grow anyway, so I just leave it. <laughs> um, so again, those customers that desire non-traditional chemistry, they now have a liquid and a granular option. And, um, you know, we're really, really excited about that. We were, gosh, we were hoping we were going to get this, this product uh, launched um, earlier, but, you know, you know, stuff happens and um, a, a lot of it, most of it, majority of it, nearly all of it was out of our control. Shocker there. And um, so we're just doing our best to get it in your hands as quickly as possible in the end. That's really what we want to do. It's really a, it's a topic of discussion every day for me and my boss and folks that uh, control this side of the thing, of the business. Um, so it's going to replace corn gluten. You're going to, you know, labor is such an issue now. You can, because you can get six and one on that single application, you know, you're, you're very likely you're not going to have to get out to the property as frequently. Um, it's ready to use, right? So unlike the liquid, which you do have to mix, um, it's ready to use. Just drop in the spreader and go. Um, and for those customers, again, it's going to be that, that, that product that's going to be the go-to product. Like Fiesta. So Fiesta liquid kind of broke the mold for, for, for this market, for this, for, for, for this opportunity. And Fiesta Granular Weed and Feed is just going to follow Fiesta Liquid's lead on this one. Uh, th those folks that are interested in, in the liquid and, uh, you know, just because it's a ready to use or just because it's a granular, they want to go, go down that route. That's already been, that path has already been cleared by the, by, by the liquid Fiesta. And here I am at 801. So I really appreciate it. I know I covered a lot of information. There's my contact information. Please call me if you have any questions or please ask them now. Yeah, Eric, how you doing? My name is Augustino Mealy from Mealy Landscaping. We spoke before. Absolutely, Augustino. How you doing, man? Good, Good to see you. You too. Hi, Barry. How you doing? Um, yeah, so my question is, I'm still having trouble with getting results from the Fiesta, even though I tried higher rates, Yucca, I put that stuff in there. Um, I'm still having trouble getting results. Okay. I don't know what I'm doing wrong. So what are you trying? Okay. The, um, the, the first, the first thing could be was we, a uh, question is what, you know, what are the temperatures that you're, that you're, that you're applying it at? Um, what are your rates and what are you trying to control? Uh, yeah. And temperatures then, were like in the seventies. Okay. Um, some uh, controlling uh, chickweed, plantain, clover, Dandelion, I did have results with. That was easy. Um, yeah. Okay. So I went to five ounces to the to the gallon, um, seven ounces, even all the way up to ten ounces. Okay. So. So uh, did yeah. you did 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 the clover? Because I've seen, for example, I personally have seen, and you know, in my my personal experience, I've seen clover, for example. You know, the first application it laughs at, but the second application it has destroyed it. So sometimes, sometimes the timing is not. Uh, sometimes you shouldn't wait the whole three to four weeks before the second application. And if you're not, I would suggest if you're not seeing efficacy, if you're not seeing that plant uh, react to the initial application, go ahead and hit it again. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, how many ounces? Per gallon, assuming that one gallon is going to do about a thousand square feet. Yeah. So coverage, coverage is super important. That's another good question. So, you know, um, are are you are you broadcasting it, and how are you applying it? A uh, spot mm -hmm. with a backpack, uh, four or five gallon backpack spreader. Sprayer. Okay. So right. Okay. Fair enough. So if you're doing, if you're putting on uh, five ounces in a gallon of water in a backpack. You know, that's, um, you just got to make sure you spray that weed until point of runoff. Yeah. So I you're did, seeing, yeah. yeah, you know, you're just, you know, you spray until you think it's point of runoff and you give it a little bit more. <laughs> All right. Well, I saw it. I mean, cover, cover, pictures, covers is, yeah. yeah. The pictures you showed on Exalus were, were like excellent. You know, I mean, but, you know. That's yeah, good. that's my expense. That, that, that was yeah. that's my that's my you know, it wouldn't hurt, you know, if, if you need to. Um, it's hard to say. I mean, are you you know, plantain plantain can get big too. They can get big and mature and get they can get off that is a tough really weed. quick. Yeah, that's a tough yeah. weed, but, um, is a weed. So I would, you know, I think I, I've often said that 
um, Fiesta and Fiesta for, for all intents and purposes, if it's a broadleaf weed, it's going to kill it. It's just a matter of how diligent you're willing to be on the applications. I've been, you know, I, I, I've been diligent. I've tried. I don't know what I could yeah. go wrong. I, I, could it be water pH? I mean, I've been doing this. I've been no, spraying not, weeds not, for like, I, I've been spraying weeds for over 30 years. So, you know. Yeah, no, not, not, not likely, Augustino. It's not, it's not really pH sensitive until you get way outside the range. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, you're, in, you're in New York State, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, another thing, Frank Rossi gives it very good recommendations. You might also want to contact him and see what tips he could give. I, I know him. I've met, yeah. been to many of his um, meetings and yeah, sure. his speeches, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, oh, yeah, you know, get, get, when it warms, hey, Augustino, when it really warms up nice, I, I know 70 is fine. 70 should be just totally fine. Um, uh, and I'm not, I'm not suggesting that it's not, but it will work just like any other herbicide. It will work better in warmer temperatures, even um, warmer. You know, the warmer, yeah. So that you know, regardless, that weed has to be actively growing. So if you're getting out there and um, maybe just try in warmer temperatures and see what happens, that would be one one other suggestion. Okay, all right. Because you know, without being out there, where are you in New York? Uh, New Rochelle, primarily. Yeah. What's yeah. just the county? So you're Southern. not you're not you're not you're not experiencing this on just a, on like your yard. You're experiencing on several several of your customers' yeah. lawns. Yeah, it's 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 yeah. broad. Yeah, it's broad. It's not yeah, just one property. Yeah, it's it's weird sometimes. Yeah, it's hard to figure out. Um, and we run across this every every once in a while. We just can't figure out what the variable is, because with these biopesticides, um, you know, there's there's more variables that 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 come into play, right? When you're looking at temperature, when you're looking at um, coverage, when you're looking at the variety of the weed, the maturity of the weed, et cetera. Um, there's just more variables that come into play. So we just got to make sure we kind of check off all those boxes. And then once we do that and it's still not working, then that's where it becomes kind of a big, um, a big question. And because this, have you, has it just been this year? Have you have you ever had success with no, this? No, no, in the last couple of years, I've tried mm -hmm. it on and off. Mm -hmm. So you've never used it really successfully, other than on dandelions, right? Mm hmm. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, if it's working I on tried, dandelions, you know. it, yeah, yeah. So I would suggest if you can't, if you can get out there and, you know, sp try to spray, you know, spray on day, day one, whatever that looks or day zero, spray on day zero, and then get out there on day one and see if you're seeing any impact or uh, any efficacy on that, on those, on those particular weeds. If you're not, hit them again. Okay. And then, and then I'll be surprised if you're still having problems. I'll okay. be surprised. Yeah. All right, I'll try it. And give me a call. You got my number, man. We talked. Yeah, I got it. Thank you. Okay. You got it. Thank you. Thank you for attending. You're welcome. Hey, any other questions? Hmm. Eric, thank you so much. A lot of great detail there. Um, <laughs> love your products. Have for years. Can't wait to see the granular. Yeah, uh, sounds like a great product. Yeah, we, yeah, we will be we will be handling that uh, and marketing it too. Um, <clears throat> all good stuff. Yeah, thank you, Barry. Sure thing. Um, so we still have several more of these sessions scheduled. Um, next week we have Bill Skerritt from ICT Organics. Uh, he has a product line of uh, mostly liquid products that are plant-based. Uh, we, we've used them for years. Um, and Eric knows the owner there too. So, but so yeah. that, that'll be our, our next uh, talk. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we do have Fiesta on sale. Uh, the sale price is up on our website. So place your orders in and get that done for you. Um, spring's a good time to be applying it. And we will see you and more people next week. Thank you all very much. All right. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Thank everybody. You.
Thanks a lot, Brian. Take care. Thanks, Eric. Have a great night, everybody. You too.